As I think you uh, probably remember, Fran and I spent uh, three years in Karachi, Pakistan, where I pastored the International Church. And a good friend of mine, who was an Old Testament professor up in Gujanwala, which was about 800 miles north of Karachi, was kind of kind of humorous because people sometimes would say to me, do you see Aslam? You know, it's like Karachi, which is the, I think the, uh, fifth most populated country in the world, as if, you know, I saw somebody who lived 800 miles away, you know, like you would see your next door neighbor. I said, do you see your friend in Chicago, uh, you know, regularly? But anyhow, uh, on one occasion, he did invite me to his daughter's wedding and to have a part in his daughter's wedding. And it's a three-day affair. It begins on Thursday evening. With just the bride's family, my friend uh, got a tent, which he had put up on the seminary campus where he taught. It was about the size of this room. So we're talking about a major celebration. I just want you to realize that. And on that Thursday night, there's a great meal. Uh, there's a celebration. It's when they the women put henna. You know, henna is that reddish brown. Uh, temporary dye that they put on the hands and on the feet uh, of the bride. And that's done on Thursday night and we celebrate and there's folk dancing and it's a, a wonderful time. And then Friday is the day of the wedding. And the groom comes with a little band riding on a white horse. I mean, this is what they do. I mean, this is not a rich family. This is this is an ordinary family, but they have a lot of, a lot of friends. The two fathers, who were both Christians, and the two young people were Christians, um, the families gathered and, and uh, before they went into the church, and they sang uh, Psalm 133, and uh, which goes like this, begins like this, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Wonderful thing. Then uh, my friend was asked for the dowry, and he gave the other father uh, uh, I forget how many rupees, but it was about $20. And, and uh, is that all your daughter's worth, he said? And they joke a bit about that because they, they don't do the dowry anymore. But then we had the wedding, wonderful Christian wedding. Uh, I had a part in that, as I say. And then afterwards, with the big reception in the big tent again. Then the bride goes back with her parents to their home, and the groom goes back with his parents to his home. By the way, these are arranged marriages. Saturday, my friend rents a bus, and we take the three-hour ride from Gujarwala to Rawalpindi, where we are going to have another reception with the groom's family. And then the bride stays with the groom, and uh, they are now she's now subject to the mother-in-law. So uh, hopefully, the mother-in-law is a nice person who loves his loves her daughter-in-law. Three great feasts. I felt like I had a taste of heaven, of the marriage supper of the Lamb, which John describes in Revelation 19 when he says, I, I seem to hear the voice of a great multitude like the sound of many waters and the sound of the mighty thunder peals. You can imagine what that sounded like, crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. No wonder Andrew took that for Messiah. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then I saw heaven open and there was a white horse. The rider is called Faithful and True. His name is called the Word of God. And on his robe and on his name he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord is the groom coming on the white horse, and we're the bride of Christ, and there's a great marriage supper. As I say, I had kind of a taste of that, I felt, in Pakistan. And Isaiah 25 is a fitting anthem, a great poem for that celebration. There's a refrain, and the first verse I, it seems to me like a refrain, 
Oh, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I'll praise your name, for you've done wonderful things. Plans of old, faithful and sure, wonderful things. Magnificent things. Miraculous blessings. Unanticipated blessings. Lord, you've done wonderful things. That same word, that same adjective, wonderful, is used when Moses celebrated the crossing of the Red Sea on dry land in Exodus 15. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonderful things? I hope you can be enthused about the wonderful things that God has done for you. As I think of my life, as I think of just my relationship with him, no thanks to me, he's done wonderful things. Lord, you've done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. Plans formed of old. Before the foundation of the world, we were told, we were called chosen names by God. We're his. Lord, you've done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. That's a difficult phrase to translate from the Hebrew into English here. It's something like being faithful in your faithfulness or faithful faithfulness. There's no question about the faithfulness. If you're going to get it done, you're going to do it. Uh, I love uh, Psalm 36 where God's faithfulness is praised. Your steadfast love, steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. How precious is your steadfast love, O oh God. And then I like to, I would repeat the refrain, O oh Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you, I praise your name, you've done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, sure. Now the first stanza sounds a, a little bit off-putting in a way because it's talking about judgment, but it's revealing to us the standard of God for judging. The first stanza would go like this, ruthless nations will fear you, for you've been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the need in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm, a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of Song of the ruthless was still. Ruthless nations will fear you. The song of the ruthless was still. I look to see where that word ruthless appeared. In one place it does appear. I think I might have mentioned this incident to you before. Jeremiah has a word for Jehoiakim, a ruthless king of Judah. The Lord says destruction is certain for Jehoiakim who builds his palace with forced labor. By not paying wages, he builds injustice into its walls and oppression into its door frames and ceilings. He says, I'll build a magnificent palace with huge rooms and many windows paneled throughout with fragrant cedar and painted a lovely red. But a beautiful palace does not make a great king, Jeremiah says. Why did your father Josiah reign so long? Because he was just and right in his deeds. That's why God blessed him. He made sure that justice and help were given to the poor, the needy, and everything went well for him. Isn't that what it means to know me, says the Lord? But you, you, Jehoiakim, are full of selfish greed and dishonesty. You murder the innocent and oppress the poor and reign ruthless. O Lord, you've been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm, a shade from the heat. Psalm 40, 146 says, Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord their God who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. 
The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. The way of the wicked, he brings to ruin. Those are God's standards. And because they're his standards, and his way of judging, they got to be our standards, our values, our concerns, how we choose to serve. Oh Lord, you are God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name. You've done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful, sure. Then the second stanza talks about a wonderful thing. It talks about the peace that I mentioned earlier. The Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food. A feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained. Clear. Again, the psalmist reminds us that it's the Lord who brings food from the earth and wine to gladden the human heart and oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen the human heart. I hope you do, as Fran and I do, wherever we are, if we give thanks at every meal. It's a way of reminding ourselves that God is the giver of every good gift, but certainly the food that is brought us. And eating a good meal, I hope you agree with me. I hope your digestive system and your appetite is still good. Uh, there's nothing like eating a, a good meal with friends and family. I can't do that so much now, but we love it. That's what we usually do on Thanksgiving. That's what we usually do again on Christmas. We can't do it this year probably, but it's a wonderful experience. And it's always used through scripture as, as the mark of fellowship. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And of course a lot of the religious people were upset about that because he ate with sinners. Thank God he did. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous but the sinners. The Lord's Supper, we call it the, the joyous feast of the people of God. It, it, a reminder to eating Eating with the Lord is a wonderful thing. Jesus at the Last Supper said, I look forward to the day when I'll eat it anew in the kingdom. Maybe looking forward to that final day when we'll be together for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those, John says, who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. O oh Lord, you are my God. I'll exalt you. I'll praise your name. You've done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. Then it gets even better. The third stanza The Lord will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. And the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the world. It's partly fulfilled for you and I today when we die. We'll go and be with the Lord, which is far better. But hopefully there'll be some people who will weep for us. We'll be hurt. And when we lose a loved one, we certainly weep for that loved one, even though when they're in Christ, we know they're with Christ, but that doesn't make that makes it easier. It makes it different, but there's still pain. We still have to die. The shroud of death is still over everybody. And when he comes again, then this will be fulfilled. The shroud will be removed. The sheet of death will be gone. The Lord will wipe away all the tears. The disgrace will be taken away. Perishable puts on the imperishable, then will come that saying, Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? John saw a new heaven and a new earth in the last book of the Bible. He heard a, a loud voice saying, The throne of God is with men, the home of God is with men. He'll dwell with them. They'll be his people. God himself will be with them. He'll wipe away every tear. From their eyes and mourning and crying and death will be no more. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you've done 
done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. And then the last stanza will be said on that day, the day of Advent. Lo, this is our God. We waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord whom we have waited for. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. There are 18 days left in this Advent season. Children certainly wait with expectation for Christmas. I think we do too. I, I hope you do. I love, I love the lights. I, li I like the distance. Playing with the blinking lights, but anyhow, that's me. Again, you may have different tastes. That's okay. I love the music. I love the fellowship. I love the meals. We wait for it when that child is given to us. That wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But we also look forward with anticipation to the second advent. When there will be no more death, and no more pain, and no more tears, and there'll be endless peace on the earth. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you, I'll praise your name, for you've done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. So be it.